Hello, everyone. Uh, happy Tuesday and welcome to this Grattan Institute 15 Minute Speed Briefing. I'm Danielle Wood, CEO of the Grattan Institute. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands from which we join this webinar today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, today, I am joined in speaking about so-called jobs for mates and all the detail from Grattan's latest report, New Politics, A Better Process for Public Appointments, by my co-author and LinkedIn stalker extraordinaire, Kate Griffiths. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, Danny. Uh, I'd also like to recognise the work of our wonderful co-authors, Annika Stobert and Owen Emsley, uh, not to mention Tom Crowley and many Grattan interns that helped with the huge data collection exercise that underpins this piece of research. This is the first in a three-report series that Grattan has underway looking at opportunities to make politics better in Australia. Anthony Albanese has says he wants a new politics and we think one important step towards that is trying to ensure that federal and state government ministers make decisions in office that put the public interest above party interests. So the three reports in the new politics series focus on the areas where we think there is clear scope to do better. Uh, so they include ending the jobs for mates culture that we're going to talk about today, uh, putting an end to the pork barrelling of government grants, and stopping taxpayer-funded advertising being used for political messaging. So do stay tuned for those in coming months. Uh, why does it matter? The types of conduct that we're talking about in these reports are a form of corruption, you know, what we often refer to as grey corruption or misuse of office. It damages our institutional fabric and, and over time it chips away at trust and support for the democratic system itself. So this matters. Uh, we should all care about it. Uh, we really welcome the momentum that I think is building to do politics differently. A lot of the focus to date has been on the need for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission, and we absolutely support that. Uh, but it's really important to remember that that is a last line of defence. Um, the point of this series, the point of pre Grattan's previous work on lobbying and political donations, is there are things that we also need to do upstream to try and make politics cleaner. Um, so you're all busy people. Um, Kate is going to give us a short presentation on the highlights of the report. And then we will take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, you know the drill. Please put your questions in early. Uh, that will give you the best shot of having yours chosen. Um, so over to you, Kate. Please tell us a little bit more about the political appointments report uh, and the findings and recommendations. Absolutely. Look, I'm going to share some slides because at Grattan we love charts. When we took on this project, what we wanted to understand was if these sorts of reports in the media of political appointments were just a handful of captain's picks or if there was something more pervasive and consequential going on. We looked at thousands of public appointments to boards of government businesses, tribunals, statutory agencies, commissions, cultural institutions, and we found that about 7% of appointees have a direct political connection. But when we looked at the best paid, the most powerful, and the prestigious appointments, it was 21%, so one in five. And I want to say we used a pretty narrow definition of political appointment. We counted only people who are former politicians, staffers, or party officials. We didn't count party members or donors, known friends and family, or those with clear ideological links. We excluded them mainly because they can't be consistently identified from publicly available information. But what that means is that the level of political affiliation we unearth is only a flaw. So let's dive in. What you see here is that some of the best paid government business boards are often politicised. And this is not just a problem of one jurisdiction or one side of politics. This is across the board. We see in most jurisdictions across Australia, at least one in 10 members of these government business boards have a political affi affiliation and it's overwhelmingly to the same side of politics as the, the appointing government. In terms of uh, the connections we see uh, in these government businesses, we're talking about really big businesses here. We're talking about Australia Post, NBN, uh, in Victoria, the public transport operator V-Line, in Sydney, Sydney Water. These are big businesses that manage uh, that employ thousands of people and manage income in the billions. Um, so this is, you know, big business here. When we looked at powerful positions, we see that a lot of them are also politicised. 
We looked at a suite of powerful boards at federal and state levels, mainly regulators and commissions. We chose these two jurisdictions because of their long-serving governments uh, as at April 2022. Um, and as you can see here, about 20% of powerful federal appointees and about 12% of powerful Victorian appointees have political connections. Again, overwhelmingly to the same side of politics as the appointing government. Just to sort of give you a bit more of an illustration, um, you can see on the left-hand side, the Productivity Commission and the Commonwealth Grants Commission really stand out. Half their boards are directly connected to the appointing government. And on the right-hand side, Sustainability Victoria, a third of board members have political affiliations. When we looked at prestigious appointments, we found a really similar rate and a really similar pattern. <clears throat> at the left-hand side, we see Old Parliament House Board. Now, political connections there might make a bit more sense, and it does look a bit more even-handed. But then the next three, the War Memorial, the National Maritime Museum, the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, more than a third of board members are directly connected to the appointing government. Perhaps the worst offender uh, was the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. The Administrative Appeals Tribunal, or AAT, uh, is an independent expert body that reviews government decisions on everything from child support to migration status. These positions are powerful. They're prestigious and full-time members earn between almost $200,000 and $500,000 a year. And you can see in this chart that political appointments to the AAT have grown substantially in recent years. We are now at almost 30% of new appointments going to people directly linked to the appointing party. Many of these appointments were also made in the lead up to the 2019 and 2022 elections. So that's a real sign that there's politicisation going on. If Australia had a transparent, merit-based appointments process, then perhaps we could be confident that appointees were there on merit, whether or not they have political connections. But sadly, we don't. What we have is a patchwork of different processes for different appointments. Many public appointments have no published process at all. And even some of the better processes, such as the process for appointing ABC and SBS board members, can still ultimately be sidestepped by the minister. So what we recommend? We put forward a new consistent process for all public appointments, drawing on best practice internationally. And frankly, this is not revolutionary. This is normal practice for most jobs. We recommend appointments be advertised, selection criteria published, an independent panel should be putting forward a shortlist to the minister, and the minister can choose from the shortlist or redefine the selection criteria. But what they shouldn't be doing is going outside the process and making a captain's call. We recommend establishing a public appointments commissioner to provide oversight of this new process. The commissioner or their representative would sit on the independent panel so they'd have some oversight of the process itself and they would report to parliament on all board and tribunal appointments. And when it comes to statutory appointments to the public service, the public service commissioner could play that role. Ultimately, we hope that the recommendations in this report, along with our next two reports uh, on preventing pork barreling and on taxpayer funded advertising, will help lay the foundations for a new way of doing politics in Australia that safeguards the public interest over political interests. I'll hand you back to Danny now. Fantastic. Thank you, Kate. Um, look, everyone has been very quiet in the questions. I don't know if it is this topic, um, but, but let me kick off with a question to, to you, Kate. I mean, I talked a little bit in my introduction about why this matters um, because of the sort of damaging effect on public trust in institutions and democracy. Um, why do politicised appointments particularly matter? You know, what's the, the actual um, trouble that we're trying to address here? Yeah, so I think the most obvious reason is when you think about who we might be missing out on, that we're not getting the best people for this, these jobs. In some cases, the best person may have a political affiliation, but in many cases, they may be someone that the minister doesn't personally know, fancy that. And so, in those cases, we're missing out on the best people to run these really important institutions and to make some incredibly important decisions that affect all Australians and Australian public policy. So I think that's the most obvious damaging consequence, but possibly the ones that are more pervasive 
um, and maybe more long do more long term damage are what it does to the perceptions around the institutions and around trust more generally. So even if a candidate and appointee is fully capable of the job, their presence if it's perceived to be politicised, can be enough to undermine the independence of the institution, can affect how others within the institution uh, behave, assuming perhaps that loyalty is more important than merit. It can affect ultimately um, how society sees interactions with government and business sees interactions with government with that perception that there's a culture of patronage going on here and um, that perhaps, you know, rocking the boat or frank and fearless advice um, are going to be career limiting. So I think there's a whole range of different worrying consequences um, and I'd say it's not just about the direct um, implications of the person in the job, it's also about the perceptions around that person. Yeah, I remember our, um, our former CEO, John Daly, wrote about um, this as a broader issue in his gridlock report about why policy reform has been hard and made the point um, it's for people outside the political process if they see this kind of loyalty being rewarded maybe they're kind of less likely to to put forward um things that um would would rock the boat and do the difficult policy reforms um lots of questions coming in now i'm delighted to see um we've got an anonymous question about whether the analysis looked at the diversity of appointments to, to boards and what might be the impact of political appointments on on board diversity yeah, I think the diversity question, because it wasn't a focus of our research, is one that's just sort of um, bubbled up in discussions around uh, what the sorts of recommendations we're putting forward, what sort of consequences they might have for diversity. And I think it's really important that we see, um, obviously, a, a sort of a more transparent process, one that people can apply for more broadly, is going to help with diversity. But I also think that it's the role of the independent panels it's really important that those panels themselves include a range of different perspectives and that there's some diversity there. We don't want just one public appointments commissioner making every appointment. That's not going to help the situation either. We do want to see them assembling a diverse range of panels for different appointments as appropriate, including, you know, people with um, community perspectives where that's relevant to the, to the institution too. Fantastic. Um, does the work look at um, ambassadorial overseas posting roles? Uh, we did look at this uh, briefly. It's a really interesting one. There's, there's a lot of um, questions about whether diplomatic roles have, whether there's kind of a stronger need for the political experience in diplomatic roles. And certainly there's a long history of political connections to certain diplomatic postings, uh, particularly the UK and the US. What's happened in terms of recent years is we're seeing more uh, political appointees to a wider range of those positions. It's still not uh, enormous in the scheme of things, uh, but there's, it's now um, Tokyo, it's now um, Singapore, it's now other parts of the world. So it's expanding um, that political reach. And the real risk here uh, is fundamentally that a change of government could result in having a, quite a wide range of ambassadors pulled. And if that happens, then that starts to sort of destabilise um, Australia's diplomatic efforts. I think that that's the, the main risk of politicisation in the diplomatic space. These are certainly prestigious appointments and then there's many people, um, many different people who could be considered for the roles. In some cases, political experience may well be very valuable to them. Fantastic. Um, really interesting question from Trent. Stevens um, around that sort of disparity be between jurisdictions when we looked at the government business enterprise boards. Um, he asked, you know, what, what are the reasons for the differences between jurisdictions? Is it differences in process or, or maybe differences in the kinds of appointments available? Um, what, what's going on? Yeah. Why does South Australia look so great? <laughs> Very hard to pin that down. I think in the case of, say, South Australia, like there are uh, only three government businesses in South Australia, so there's there's not many in that state. But I suspect different governments, different choices, some are longer serving than others, and we certainly saw um, in Victoria and um, at the federal level where there are particularly long-serving governments, you have more opportunity, I guess, over that period of time to appoint more members. Um, that might be one factor. The other thing I'd note is that uh, other than South Australia, where there were no political appointees, they're all um, 
even New South Wales that has a relatively low level of, of politicisation of its government business boards, they're all higher than what we saw when we went and looked at the ASX. So when we looked at the ASX 100 boards, because we were thinking, you know, these are um, big businesses, what would be a commercial um, sort of comparison? And in the ASX, it's less than 2% of board members, ASX 100, less than 2% of political of board members have those political connections. So it suggests that those skills aren't really valued in the private sector more broadly and definitely raises the question of why it's needed at all in the in the government sector. Fantastic. I'm just going to very quickly try and answer the last couple. Um, Stan Cap has asked about um, whether the appointees can be terminated and how quickly can we move to the Grattan model. Um, uh, generally, they are um, sort of fixed appointments and part of the reason is actually to safeguard independence. Um, so short of kind of uh, a wholesale shift, as has been suggested, might happen with the AAT, which would effectively involve kind of disbanding and rebuilding, um, you know, those people would, would stay to the end of their term, but we could immediately transition at least for new appointments to having a better process in place. Uh, there was a issue, there was a question raised about David Browse about competence and whether any work's been uh, undertaken trying to compare how these um, politically aligned appointees perform relative to others. Uh, really difficult question to answer. I think I think competence um, certainly can be an issue. Um, there is some work um, for the Administrative Appeals Tribunal that suggests that the the appointees with political connections are less likely to be hitting performance targets than, than those other appointees. Um, so there is um, some empirical evidence on that, David, but as you can imagine, quite difficult to compile. Um, I have gone over. I'm normally absolutely rigorous with time, but 15 minutes is a pretty uh, tough ask. Uh, can I say thank you to everyone for joining us? Um, thank you to Kate for an excellent overview of the report. Uh, you can find a link to the report in the chat. Uh, please consider making a donation to the Grattan Institute. Um, we do not do any commissioned work to maintain our independence uh, and it is our supporters that make it possible to do this type of research. Uh, as someone said to me yesterday, Grattan says the things that need to be said but that others can't. Um, so I hope we have a, an ongoing role trying to make the case for, for better politics in Australia. Thank you all for joining us and, and have a lovely afternoon.